Mark and Lori had been happily married for years, dreaming of a brighter future together. Finally, that dream was becoming a reality with Mark's acceptance into medical school. They were over the moon with excitement, and Lori's pregnancy only added to their joy. They began planning their move to North Carolina, where Mark would begin his journey towards becoming a doctor, and Lori would start her new life as a mother. Unfortunately, a few days before their departure, Lori disappeared, and a lifetime of lies and betrayals was brought to light. Lori K. Soares was born in California on December 31, 1976. When she was four months old, she and her older brother Paul were adopted by a couple named Thelma and Harold Soares. She grew up in California until 1987, when her parents got divorced. After the divorce, Lori's mother decided to move to Utah. Her brother, Paul, had to go on a mission, so he stayed in California, leaving Thelma and Lori to go alone to Utah. During this period, Lori and her mother became very close because they were now alone together. Lori enrolled in Orem High School. She was a very simple, kind, and well-liked girl among her classmates. She was very popular and had even been elected class representative several times. She was also a very sporty girl who loved playing baseball. However, Lori and her mother didn't have a lot of money, so to financially support her mother while studying, she had found a small job at a car wash center. Lori was a serious and responsible young girl who helped her mother as much as she could. In high school, she met Mark, who, like her, belonged to the Mormon community. He was born on April 24, 1978, into a big family. His parents, Doug and Janet, had seven children, so Mark had three brothers and three sisters. He was the fifth child in the family. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was very important to their family. His father was a highly respected pediatrician in the community, which gave the family a certain social standing. Mark and his family lived in a spacious house with no financial worries, thanks to his father. All the children were brilliant, each with their own talents and strengths. The family valued their image within the community and Mark, a lively boy with red curls and freckles, stood out. What you should know about Mark is that, from a young age, he had a tendency to lie. He would do it to make others laugh, to avoid problems, or to make himself interesting. He always felt a kind of pressure to measure up, to be as successful as his brothers and sisters. I can't tell you if this pressure was directly exerted by his parents or if it was self-imposed, but either way, you'll see that it plays a role in his personality and the events that unfold. It was by making himself interesting that he first caught Lori's attention. Mark and Lori attended the same camp, but they weren't in the same class because Mark was a little younger than she was. She had never really paid attention to Mark before, but the chemistry was immediate, and the two young people spent the night talking. After that evening, they were inseparable. It was the beginning of their love story, and in the eyes of everyone, they formed a beautiful couple. Both were very much appreciated, Lori for her kindness and Mark for his good humor. At 19, like all other young men in the Mormon church, Mark went on a mission. The mission usually lasts two years, and during that time, the young men are under the supervision of other members of the church. They must cut all ties with their families and are only allowed to call them on holidays. During this particular period, but throughout their lives, they are subject to a certain number of rules, such as not smoking, drinking, watching television, etc. Only reading is allowed. Also, they are not allowed to contact the opposite sex. At first, everything went well for Mark. Being of an extroverted nature, he was really good at making contact with people and was more successful than others in converting new followers. However, in the evenings, after spending the whole day proselytizing for the Mormon church, Mark was housed in a university town surrounded by many other chains. For him, it was a new life, a new freedom, but also one with many temptations. That's how he started leading a double life. There was Mark hacking with his girlfriend, the son of a highly respected doctor in the community and a very active member of the church. And in the evening, there was the anonymous Mark, partying among other young people who drank, smoked, and had affairs, breaking all the rules. He was very sociable and had made a group of friends. He would meet several girls and even flirt with them. All this, while Lori, madly in love with him, waited patiently at home, and he enjoyed this new freedom. His nighttime antics were discovered by some other members of the community that were present there, and the punishment was immediate. Mark was sent home earlier than expected. You must know that when a young Norman is sent home because he fails in his mission, it is a real shame for the family, as it implies that the parents have not properly guided him to become a good adult who respects the rules and precepts of their religion. Also, to avoid bringing discredit to his family and certainly to avoid having to assume these deviations and mistakes, as he had done since his young age, Mark lied to his parents and to Lori. He told them that he had been the victim of a misunderstanding, that he had been mistakenly associated with a group, and that was the reason why he had been sent home earlier than expected. After returning home, he resumed his life as if nothing had happened. He enrolled in university and continued his relationship with Lori. In 1999, when she was about to finish her studies, Lori and Mark got married. They looked like the ideal couple, and he was very appreciated in the community. Their friends knew how much Lori was in love with him. She felt like she was living the life she had always dreamed of. Moreover, Mark knew how to make himself appreciated. 
He gave the impression of being a very attentive husband. Lori had always dreamed of marrying a man who would love her for who she was and who would also belong to the community. She wanted to start her own family, have children, and everything seemed to be going in that direction. Thelma liked him a lot too. She saw her daughter happy by his side, and he knew how to make himself admirable. He seemed to be the ideal son-in-law. Mark was described by everyone as a kind and helpful person. He taught catechism to children at the church. He was always very helpful and willing. A few months after their marriage, Lori graduated and quickly found a job as a commercial assistant at Wells Fargo. Mark dreamed of becoming a doctor like his father, but it was a long journey. While Lori had entered the workforce, he was still a student and worked part-time at a local hospital as a psychiatric unit aide. It was only a small job, but it allowed him to contribute to the household. In 2004, Mark and Lori had been married for about five years. Lori was still working at Wells Fargo and everything seemed to be going well for the couple. Mark finally obtained his degree that year, allowing him to enter medical school. He was going to be able to fulfill his dream and had been admitted to the medical school in North Carolina to study for a long time. His whole family was happy for him, everyone knew that it was his dream. Lori, his biggest supporter, was also very happy except for the fact that she had to leave her country. Her friends, family, and work were all in Utah. The big move was coming soon, and the couple had planned a farewell party. And as good news never comes alone, Lori had just found out that she was pregnant. Mark was thrilled, everything was going well for the couple, who were preparing to take a decisive turn in their lives. However, as she was cherishing her final days in a job she loved, a minor incident took place on July 16. She received a phone call that seemed to upset her so much that day that she left work early in tears without giving any explanations to her colleagues. Two days later, the couple threw a big party to celebrate their departure for North Carolina and Lori's co-workers were reassured to see her smiling and happy. However, the next morning at 10.07 a.m., Mark called the police as he was worried that his wife had gone to Memory Grove Park to jog but had not returned. Everyone tried to call her, but she didn't answer and no one knew where she was. Her car was quickly found in a parking lot near where she was supposed to be running, but there was no trace of Lori. Mark was very worried because this was not like Lori at all, she was pregnant and would never have missed work without warning. He officially reported her disappearance to the police at 10.30 a.m. The police immediately began their investigation and went to Lori's family home to examine the house and her belongings. They immediately noticed several disturbing facts that, taken independently, may seem like insignificant details, but which immediately caught the investigator's attention. Firstly, they quickly realized that Lori's handbag was still present at home, with all her identity papers inside. Women never go out without their purses, even if it can happen, it's quite rare. This was the first red flag. As they searched the house a little more, they also noticed that Lori's wedding ring was on the dresser. The investigators wondered why Lori would remove her wedding ring to go jogging. This was the second red flag. The investigators also found Lori's car keys, so how could her car be found in a parking lot far from her home while her keys were still at home? Examining Lori's car, the police officers noticed that the driver's seat had been pushed back as if a tall person had been the last one to drive it. This immediately seemed suspicious to them since Lori was rather short. At the couple's home, they also found many other suspicious things, including a letter written by Lori that worried the investigators. The lovely couple seemed to be having problems. In fact, on the letter, it was written, I want to grow old with you, but I cannot do it under these conditions. I cannot imagine my life without you, but if things do not change, I will ask for a divorce. Moreover, the house, especially the bathroom, was particularly clean, as if someone had just cleaned it. It still smelled of bleach. However, it was in the couple's bedroom that the investigators made the most troubling discovery. They noticed that there was a new mattress on the bed, as well as new sheets, which immediately caught the investigators' attention because the sheets were still folded as if they had just been taken out of their packaging. In Mark's car, they found a receipt for this famous mattress. They were able to determine that Mark had purchased the mattress at exactly 10.23 on the same day he reported his wife missing, which was quite suspicious that he would go to a store to buy a mattress and sheets right after his wife disappeared. Finally, on the bedside table, they found a hunting knife with fresh blood stains, but Mark had an explanation for everything. The hunting knife was a knife he had recently used and left on the bedside table. As for the mattress, he told the investigators that a few days earlier Lori had her period and had stained the mattress, so he had decided to throw it in a dumpster a few days ago. When asked where he had slept in the meantime, Mark said that they had both slept on the box spring without a mattress. Of course, the investigators didn't believe a word he said. All suspicions were now turned towards Mark. The media took hold of the story, and Mark was initially supported by the entire community. He even made a tearful appearance on TV. Days passed, and Lori was still missing. 
The investigators were now convinced that Mark was not a stranger to his wife's disappearance. The forensic analysis confirmed that the bloodstains found on the hunting knife in the bedroom belonged to Lori. Moreover, by examining Mark's car, they found traces of his wife's blood inside. Searching in the different dumpsters of the neighborhood, the investigators also managed to find the mattress thrown away by Mark in a dumpster located a few blocks from the couple's home. The most alarming thing was that the mattress had been partially cut, with a part of it removed. During the investigation, the police received a call reporting that a naked man was walking around a motel. When they arrived at the scene, they found Mark completely naked, wearing only sandals. He seemed delirious, so he was taken to a psychiatric hospital. Meanwhile, the police continued to search for evidence. They didn't have a body, and they couldn't prove that there had been a murder. So they began to investigate Mark's past, and made troubling discoveries. At first, they found out that Mark had never been enrolled in medical school, and even worse, he had dropped out two years ago. It seemed that he had been lying to his wife and family for many years. When these revelations became public, it was a real shock to everyone. Friends and family were stunned. They had always supported Mark and never believed in all the rumors that had been circulating about him, but now they had doubts. Mark, on the other hand, was still in a psychiatric hospital, and the police thought he had intentionally pretended to be crazy. He didn't fool anyone for long, though. The different experts who examined him concluded that his episode of madness was a simulation. Two of Mark's brothers then decided to go to the hospital and asked him, We need to know the truth. What really happened? It was then that Mark broke down and told his brothers everything he had been hiding for all these years. He had lied to his wife, his family, and all his friends by leading a double life. Mark had dropped out of school over two years ago and had been living a life of lies ever since. Every morning, he pretended to go to university, packing his books and preparing his things, then snuck back home when Lori left for work. He spent his day playing video games to make his life seem more believable. In the evening, he pretended to have had a hard day, locking himself in his room and sometimes even working on fake papers. He also used to arrange meetings with Lori on campus during her lunch break. For many years, he had gone to great lengths to keep his lies alive. He was leading a double life. So, you might be wondering, how did he manage to get his degree if he dropped out of university over two years ago? Well, on the day of the official graduation ceremony, Mark was feeling unwell. In reality, he had taken medication that made him vomit, and he told his wife and family that he was too sick to attend the ceremony. They believed him and even organized a small family gathering a few days later to celebrate this momentous occasion. It was at this gathering that he took a photo of himself wearing a graduation gown and cap, as if he had really received his university degree. He went even further by organizing trips to different states in the months before, supposedly to attend interviews at medical universities. And guess who paid for all these trips? Lori. She was the one who brought in almost all the household income, so she paid for the airplane tickets, hotel nights, and other expenses. She believed in her husband and their marriage and did not hesitate to provide for him, thinking that when he finally got his degree, things would turn around. However, when she discovered the truth on July 16, as she was preparing to travel to North Carolina to inquire about financial aid from the university, she was told that they did not know anyone named Mark Hacking. No one with that name was registered, and in fact, no one from Centerville had even applied. Lori was completely shocked, her world fell apart. When she returned home, she immediately confronted Mark, who denied everything, saying there must have been a computer error or confusion. He tried to reassure her by saying he would take care of everything, but Lori knew her husband and knew that he had a tendency to lie. She decided to dig a little deeper to find out what was really going on. As she dug deeper, she discovered the terrible truth. But now, despite Mark not being enrolled at the university, they had already made arrangements to relocate to North Carolina. Lori had quit her job, informed her loved ones about the move, and to make matters worse, their farewell party was scheduled for the next day. She decided not to tell anyone and to keep up appearances. She was her usual happy self, and even though some people had noticed that she seemed preoccupied at times, everyone thought it was probably just the prospect of moving and the change of life that was occupying her mind. But in the evening, after the party was over, Lori couldn't take it anymore. A violent argument erupted between her and Mark, and she told him that if things didn't change, she was going to ask for a divorce. She then retreated to her room, where she wrote a last note to Mark, which was found by investigators. After giving him this letter, she went back to bed in her room. Mark was very upset by the accusations and ultimatum that Lori had just given him. The whole false universe of lies that he had built was at risk of collapsing, and he couldn't afford to let that happen. He then entered a monstrous rage and decided to silence her forever. So, while she was sleeping peacefully in her bed, and while she was five weeks pregnant, he took his gun and entered the room silently. He slowly approached the bed in which his wife was sleeping, pointed the gun at the back of her head, and pulled the trigger. He told his brothers that he had done this to protect his false life and lies. After these terrible revelations, Mark's brothers contacted the police to tell them everything. 
He was arrested, but they still had to find the body. They told the investigators that he had dumped Lori's body in a dumpster. It was highly probable that Lori's remains were deposited in the vast public landfill, which contained over 4,000 tons of solid waste. Then, on October 1, 2004, two months after Mark's confession, one of the investigators stumbled upon a mass of curly hair identical to Lori's. Upon closer inspection, he saw that it was the remains of a body, but it was very damaged. Only through the analysis of the jaw and dental records were they able to identify that it was Lori's body. However, the medical examiner could not determine the exact cause of death. It can be concluded that the hunting knife found on the bedside table was used to cut up the blood-soaked mattress. On April 15, 2005, Mark concluded a deal, pleading guilty, and was thus sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum sentence of six years. Yes, you heard that right, a minimum sentence of six years for killing his wife. The fact that he had a minimum sentence of six years didn't mean that he was going to get released after six years. It just meant that after six years, he will have the right to request parole. This was the maximum possible sentence under Utah law at the time, but, the Utah Board of Pardons had stated that given the horrific circumstances of this murder, Mark would serve at least 30 years before being eligible for parole in 2035. The Soares family removed the name hacking from Lori's headstone. On June 6, 2005, Mark's father publicly released a letter written by his son in which he expressed his profound regrets. I know that my place is in prison. I will spend my time there doing everything I can to repair the many wrongs I have committed. Although I realize that complete atonement is impossible in this life, I have a lot of healing and changing to do. But I hope that one day I can become the man that Lori has always thought I was. For the many people I have hurt, I am more sorry than you could ever imagine. Every day, my soul burns with torment when I think of what you must be going through. I wish I could take away your pain. I wish I could take back all the lies I told and replace them with the truth. I wish I could put Lori back in your arms. My pain is deserved, yours is not. From the bottom of my heart, I ask for your forgiveness. There is no such thing as a harmless lie, no matter how small it may be. You may think that a lie only hurts the liar, but that is far from the truth. If you are on a path of lies, stop now and face the consequences. Whatever the consequences may be, they will be better than the pain you are causing yourself and others. This was the family's last statement. Today, Mark is still in prison, 18 years after pleading guilty. As for Lori's legacy, her family established a scholarship in her memory. The Lori Hacking Scholarship is awarded annually to at least one student by the University of Utah. The scholarship covers the junior and senior years of study and is specifically awarded to women who have faced challenging circumstances to pursue higher education. Lori's mother, Teresa, stated 10 years after her daughter's murder that she has found the strength to forgive her son-in-law, but will never get over it. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to follow for more crime stories.